to the Judicial Education Project, which could take and allocate the money. And guess who works for the Judicial Education Project? Carrie Severino, who also helped select this nominee running the Trump Federalist Society selection process. So the connections abound. In the Washington Post article, they point out that the Judicial Crisis Network's office is on the same hallway in the same building as the Federalist Society, and that when they sent their reporter to talk to somebody at the <clears throat> Judicial Crisis Network, somebody from the Federalist Society came down to let them up. This more and more looks like it's not three schemes, but it's one scheme with the same funders selecting judges, funding campaigns for the judges, and then showing up in court in these orchestrated amicus flotillas to tell the judges what to do. On the Judicial Crisis Network, you've got the Leonard Leo connection, obviously. She hopped in to take over for him with the Federalist Society. You've got the campaigns that I've talked about, where they take $17 million contributions. That's a big check to write, $17 million, to campaign for Supreme Court nominees. No idea who that is or what they got for it. You've got briefs that she wrote. The Republican senators filed briefs in that NFIB case signed by Ms. Severino. The woman who helped choose this nominee has written briefs for Republican senators attacking the ACA. Don't say the ACA is not an issue here. And by the way, the Judicial Crisis Network funds the Republican Attorneys General. It funds RAGA, the Republican Attorney General's Association, and it funds individual Republican Attorneys General. And guess who the plaintiffs are in the Affordable Care Act case? Republican Attorneys General. A, to me, pretty big deal. I've never seen this around any court that I've ever been involved with, where there's this much dark money and this much influence being used. Here's how the Washington Post summed it up. This is a conservative activist behind the scenes campaign to remake the nation's courts, and it's a $250 million dark money operation. $250 million is a lot of money to spend if you're not getting anything for it. So that raises the question, what are they getting for it? Well, I showed the slide earlier on the Affordable Care Act, and on Obergefell, and on Roe versus Wade, that's where they lost. But with another judge, that could change. That's where the contest is. That's where the Republican Party platform tells us to look at how they want judges to rule, to reverse Roe, to reverse the Obamacare cases, and to reverse Obergefell and take away gay marriage. That is their stated objective and plan why not take them at their word? But there's another piece of it, and that is not what's ahead of us, but what's behind us. What's behind us is now 80 cases, Mr. Chairman, 80 cases under Chief Justice Roberts that have these characteristics. One, they were decided five to four by a bare majority. Two, the five to four majority was partisan in the sense that not one Democrat, Democratic appointee joined the five. I refer to that group as the Roberts Five. It changes a little bit as with Justice Scalia's death, for instance, but there's been a steady Roberts Five that has delivered now 80 of these decisions. And the last characteristic of them is that there is an identifiable Republican donor interest in those cases. And in every single case, that donor interest won. It was an 80 to zero, five to four partisan route, ransacking. And B, I'd love to make that argument to the jury. I'd be really hard pressed to be the lawyer saying, no, 80 to zero is just a bunch of flukes. All five, four, all partisan, all this way. So something is not right around the court. And dark money has a lot to do with it. Special interests have a lot to do with it. Donors' trust and whoever's hiding behind donors' trust has a lot to do with it. 
and the Bradley Foundation orchestrating its Emmy key over at the court has a lot to do with it. So I thank you, Judge Barrett, for listening to me now a second time. And uh, I think this gives you a chance um, for you and I to tee up an interesting conversation tomorrow. And I thank my colleagues for hearing me out. Thank you, Senator. So that was Democratic Senator Sheldon Whitehouse. And I played you a long clip there because I wanted to give you the full context. I think he does a very credible job showing the links between big money conservative donors and the construction of the Supreme Court. And you can all draw this down to the appellate courts as well and to smaller courts around the country. The Republican Party with their elite donors have not just put people on the courts that tend to agree with them, but have marshaled this money and these schemes to effectively buy Supreme Court seats and, and more shockingly and more, more terrifyingly buy Supreme Court votes. And that in a sense, these donors are giving big money to put these people on the court and the people on the court that you can you can argue theoretically that once on the Supreme Court, you're given autonomy and freedom, but they know who butters their bread. These people, these conservatives being thrown on the court are, in essence, bought and paid for and that the appointments are, again are not just simply Republicans tend to appoint conservatives, but that donors are handpicking judges for Republicans like Trump and others to put on the court that big money people are telling the president and the Republican Senate who to put on the court. And those people know that they're getting these plum appointments, whether it's on appeals courts or on the Supreme Court itself, because of these donors and the Republicans that they've bought and paid for. And they're being thrown on the court. If there's ever been an argument for court packing, it's to nullify this. There's nothing in the Constitution that dictates the size of the courts. Now, what you'll hear from Republicans when they justify the sham of an appointment, even though they promised not to do it in 2016 because they said we shouldn't have an appointment in the final year. What they've said, what they've said was there's no constitutional barrier to putting Coney Barrett on the court. And they're right. There isn't. There's no time minimum required for a nomination hearing. There's no last year rule. None of that is constitutionally mandated. So by the letter of the law, they can throw this bought and paid for judge onto the court. They can do that. But the Democrats can also, if they have the, the, you know, the fortitude, if they actually do something for once, have the same constitutional right to expand the Supreme Court and appellate courts all over the country. And if these courts are bought and paid for, if these judges are bought and paid for, if they're not just principled ideological conservatives, but big money plants, it's hard to get rid of judges because you basically have to impeach them and you need a supermajority. So what you do is you nullify the bought and paid for seats by putting people that actually deserve to be there. That's what you do. The Democrats need to take this along with the hypocrisy of the Amy Coney Barrett nomination and pack the courts. I hope Sheldon Whitehouse, who's, who's done a great job here, you know, I'm, I'm, I rarely give praise to moderate Democrats, to Democrats outside of the, the, the squad and Bernie and such, but he deserves praise here for the work done. This has shown that the only response if the Democrats control the Senate after this election is to pack every court they can. 